Suspense. Tonight, Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Mr. John Lund in Experiment 6R, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Friends, I know you've enjoyed trouble-free summer driving if you've replaced those old-style narrow-gap spark plugs with wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. Tell them why, Harlow. Tell them why. Because Autolite resistor spark plugs with the exclusive built-in 10,000-ohm Autolite resistor give you a full, even spark all along the line of fire. Keep going, Harlow. You're doing great. Well, your engine idles smoother with Autolite resistor spark plugs. Performs better on leaner gas mixtures. Actually saves you gas. You're getting better all the time. Autolite resistor spark plugs cut down radio and television interference, too. So insist on Autolite resistor spark plugs. Okay, Harlow, give them the old punchline. Don't be satisfied with spark plugs supposed to be just as good. Get genuine Autolite resistor spark plugs. You're always right with Autolite. And here's a reminder, suspense may be seen on television in many parts of the country every Tuesday night. And now with Experiment 6R and with the performance of John Lund as Morris Brandt, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. Entirely fitting somehow that here in the Carlton Plaza Hotel, where he spent so much of his life, we should honor this hero of science and pay him our humble gratitude. Mr. Brandt is, as you know at this moment, in our special clinic, and it's from there that he will address us on the subject of Experiment 6R, a page in the progress of science with which his name will forever be associated. When I received his letter and heard the thrilling news that, unknown to any of us, a human volunteer had actually... <laughs> well, it was, of course, inevitable that I should call this distinguished gathering together. Uh, I won't speak any longer now because minutes are precious. Uh, we're ready. Will you speak to us now, Mr. Brandt? Ladies and gentlemen... Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Morris Brandt. Brandt speaking. I don't know exactly how you good people of science are going to take my little story, the history of my own part in Experiment 6R. When I finish my story, if I finish it, you will wonder, perhaps, why I wish to tell it at all. Well, something about the irony of this situation appeals to me. I'm going to enjoy every minute of it. You know, even the fact that somebody just now pressed a buzzer and I jumped to attention and started speaking is ironic. Because I guess that's how Experiment 6R began a couple of months ago. Yes, just like that. Brandt speaking. Coffee, Mr. Brandt. Very well, sir. It was precisely 3.15. And 3.15 was the time for Mr. Paul Koblenz's afternoon coffee. Naturally, it was beneath the dignity of the manager of the Carlton Plaza Hotel to have the coffee served by anyone less than me, the assistant manager. And so each day, the coffee tray with its silver urn, silver sugar and creamer, silver spoons, and graceful Limoges cups was left on my desk by a waiter, ready for the humiliating ceremony. I picked it up and went in. Ah, Mr. Brent. You'll join me, of course. Well, thank you, Mr. Koblenz. A little coffee is very relaxing. It was relaxing for him. My duties only began with bringing in the coffee. I had to set the silver tray on his desk and then wait while Mr. Koblenz detached a small key from his desk chain. Then it was my job to take the key and open the small wall cabinet near the heavily draped window where Koblenz kept a supply of liquor. I would take out a bottle of expensive brandy and carry it over to the desk. Koblenz liked the dash of it in his coffee. Oh, thank you, Mr. Beck. It was this part of the silly ritual that I hated most. That locked cabinet was a symbol of Koblenz's suspicion and distrust. No one but me was ever permitted to enter his sacred office, and I didn't drink. But that made no difference. The liquor was expensive and might be stolen. 
By whom? By me. Mr. Brandt, I've been looking over the monthly accounts. Your latest innovation seems to be doing uh, quite well. The stag room? Oh, that was a lucky guess. I think not. Your reasoning, I believe, was that businessmen like a place to lunch by themselves in quiet and comfort. It seems, Mr. Brandt, that you have the rare talent of knowing what people want. Well, I hope so. Especially when giving people what they want can be so uh, profitable and lead to give you what you want. Yes, indeed, Mr. Brandt. You have a very successful record during your 12 years here. Perhaps too successful. Why? What do you mean? Success has the habit of making a man crave something further. I think we shall have to have a talk some day soon, Mr. Brandt. Uh, but that will be all for today. You may replace the brandy. He handed me the little key to the cabinet. He had finished with me for the day. Back in my office, I thought of what Mr. Koblenz had said. Too successful meant only one thing. He thought that I was ambitious to hold his job, my only possible advancement. Mr. Koblenz was quite correct. I would do anything to have that job. Anything. Now, after 12 years of it, I was determined to have that job. Not because it was a better job, but because it was his. I didn't sleep well that night in my cramped inside room, thinking of Mr. Koblenz in his penthouse suite. But finally it was morning, and the hotel came to life again with all its problems. There were the usual two or three bad checks accepted by the night clerk and all the other boring, commonplace irritants. The only drama of the day was brought in by the housekeeper. Um, may I speak to you a moment, Mr. Brandt? Uh... Yes, Mrs. Upham? It's about 1402, Mr. Brandt. What seems to be the trouble? The maids won't make up 1402. Why? The room... I know it sounds crazy, but that room is full of rats. Ra live rats? Oh, nonsense. The maids are imagining no, things. It's true. I saw them myself. Very well, Mrs. Oberman. I'll see about it. Everyone's afraid to go in 1402, so I hope you can get them out of there. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Brad. Live rats. What next? Room clerk, please. Hello? Brand speaking. Who's the occupant of 1402? Dr. Tomlinson? Is he in his room? Well, when he returns to the hotel, please let me know. I shall have to speak with him. Rats. <laughs> well, it was fairly typical of the kind of problem which is automatically relayed to the assistant manager, being hardly glamorous nor important enough for the manager to be bothered with. Some difficult and taxing assignment, like uh, greeting Greer Garson, maybe, would be more fitting use for the time and talents of Paul Koblenz. As I thought about it, and him, I began to hear a sound in my head like a clock ticking. I recognized that it was almost 3.15. As busy as I was, I could sense, without looking at a clock, that it was nearly 3.15. It was time for the buzzer on my desk to sound out the call which symbolized all the tyranny, all the pompous authority, and the warped, sadistic soul of... Brandt speaking. Coffee, Mr. Brandt. Very well, sir. Again, the humiliating ritual. Performing the services of a waiter to satisfy Paul Koblenz of his authority. And today he began the talk with me that he had been promising for so long. Uh, Mr. Brandt, you have been with us for 12 years, is that correct? Yes, Mr. Koblenz. 12 years and two months. And you have always impressed me as an ambitious man. A competent man. Well, thank you, sir. But you must realize that you have come as far up the ladder as is possible. At least while I am alive. Well, I don't think that... And I am a very healthy man for my age, Mr. Brandt. Eventually, you may replace me. But, Mr. But Koblenz... it will be a long time to wait, I'm afraid. A very long time indeed. Well, I'm, I'm really awfully busy, Mr. Koblenz. I, I have observed certain signs of restlessness in you during the last year or so. Restlessness? You are not satisfied to be merely the assistant manager. You dream of occupying this desk someday. My desk. Will that be all, Mr. Koblenz? I will tell you when you may go. 
You would like to have my salary, which is very considerable, instead of your own, which is uh, a good deal smaller. <clears throat> I, I must say that uh, no one is so well qualified. If anything should uh, happen to me, you would automatically be appointed manager of the hotel. Mr. Coblenz, I'm sure we I will never... not discuss the matter further. I just wanted to, you to know that I know, as they say, what the score is. Have you finished your coffee, Mr. Koblenz? I have finished my coffee, Mr. Brandt. Good afternoon. It was exactly 3.30 as Koblenz handed me the little key to the cabinet. And I replaced the brandy. I took the coffee things back into my own office and closed the door. I knew exactly what Koblenz had meant. He had actually said, I know you would like to eliminate me in some way, and I warn you. I'm on the alert. Don't try anything funny if you know what's good for you. As if there were the slightest chance. As much as I hated him, there was nothing I could do. Mr. Brandt speaking. You asked me to call when Dr. Tomlinson returned to the hotel, Mr. Brandt. What? Oh, oh yes. Thank you. Oh, yes, sir. I am Mr. Brandt, doctor, the assistant manager of the hotel. Oh. Uh, may I step in for a moment? Well, yes, come right in. Uh, what can I do for you? Well, uh, I suppose you notice your room hasn't been straightened. And, of course, it's not difficult to see the reason why. You uh, have them caged, I see. Oh, yes, yes, you mean my rats. They're beautiful specimens, aren't they? Beautiful. How did you get them into the hotel? Oh, the uh, cage fits into a leather carrying case. <laughs> Rather clever, isn't it? I see. Well, I'm sorry, Dr. Tomlinson, but I'm afraid those rats will have to go. Yes, dear me, I was afraid of that. It would only be for another day, Mr. Brandt. I'll be returning to New York tomorrow. I, I can't leave them now. They're the subject of an experiment that may lead to the cure of an extremely deadly disease, which, for scientific purposes, we refer to as 6R. Well, I'm you, sure, Doctor. Yeah, let me show able... you something here. Yeah. You see this uh, yellow powder? Yeah, take a look at this label. Uh, paradimethyl... Doctor, I really uh, don't paradimethyl have... Paradimethylaminoasbenzamine. It's commonly called the butter yellow, Mr. Brandt. You see, when a rat gets a bit of this daily in his food, he develops 6R within four months, a spreading internal growth which insidiously destroys vital tissues. And by the time the results are evident, the rat is past all hope, and in a very short time, it's dead. Yes, Doctor, it's very fascinating, I'm sure. But... I'm afraid... Oh, will this powder induce 6R in a human being, too? Oh, almost certainly, but naturally we haven't been able to try it. No volunteers. I don't suppose it requires very large doses, either. To develop 6R? Oh, no, indeed. Just a very tiny bit daily, and then... <laughs> uh, Mr. Brandt, surely you understand the importance of this work and why I must have the rats with me constantly? But, uh... If you insist, I shall move to another hotel, of course. No, Doctor. I represent the management, and I ask you to stay. And I'll see that your room is straightened. Well, I, I must say that's wonderful of you, Mr. Brandt. Uh, are you interested in science? Not until now. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, uh, by the way, please tell the maid not to go near the cages. Sometimes the rats might bite, and it might be that they could transmit six hour that way. We're not sure, you understand, but it's better not to take any chances. Yes, I understand. Is that powder... I won't attempt to pronounce it. Is it quite safe in here? Oh, yes, yes, see? No one could find it here. I see. And besides, no one would know what it was. If some got lost, it looks just like yellow dust. It would only be thrown away. I have more for the experiments. Don't worry, Mr. Uh, Brandt. Yes. Well, I'm sorry if we've inconvenienced you, Doctor. Oh, have you had dinner? Why, no, as a matter of fact. Oh, would you join me? Seven o'clock in the grill room? Well, I should be very pleased. Good. We'll talk some more. You know, I should think that someone who, well, is desperately ill, let us say, would be honored to be your volunteer. I know in similar circumstances, I should be proud. Until seven, Doctor. Uh, you wish to see me, Mr. Brandt? Yes, Mrs. Overman. It is very important that Dr. Tomlinson finish his stay. Yes, sir. 
I will meet the chambermaid in his rooms promptly at 7.15 and see to it that the rats don't frighten them. Thank you, Mr. Brandt. The doctor arrived exactly at 7. And at 7.10, while he was still sipping his sherry, I excused myself and went up to 1402. When the chambermaid was taking the soiled linens to the laundry wagon in the hall, leaving me alone in Dr. Tomlinson's room, I filled a hotel envelope with a deadly yellow powder. I was back downstairs before the soup was served. I have never enjoyed a dinner more. Dr. Tomlinson prattled on, but I didn't even hear. I was thinking what a pleasure it was going to be to have coffee at 3.15 tomorrow afternoon with Mr. Paul Copeland. Autolite is bringing you Mr. John Lund in Experiment 6R. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, uh, Hap. Yes? My nephew went to camp this summer, and they taught him a lot of useful things, like how to send smoke signals with a brush fire and blanket. Oh? You should see the lovely charred hole in our living room rug. Yes, but did they teach him about the new wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs? No, Hap, they didn't, so I had a man-to-man talk with him. I told him, replace old-style narrow-gap spark plugs with wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs for easier starting in cold temperatures, for smoother idling. For better performance on leaner gas mixtures, they actually save you gas. Mm, that's useful information. Right. I told him confidentially, of course, that every Autolite resistor spark plug has an exclusive built-in 10,000 ohm Autolite resistor. I said insist on Autolite resistor spark plugs now. Don't accept spark plugs that are supposed to be as good. That's telling them. I said, my boy, that mighty might, that Autolite resistor, explains why Autolite resistor spark plugs mean easier starting in cold temperatures, smoother idling, better performance on leaner gas mixtures. They actually save you gas. So insist on Autolite. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage John Lund in Experiment 6R. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Brandt speaking. Coffee, Mr. Brandt. Yes, Mr. Koblenz. A waiter had just brought the tray, set it on my desk and left. My door was locked. I took out the envelope with the powder, put a pinch of it into one of the costly Limoges cups, Filled both cups with coffee from the silver pot and carried the tray into the sumptuous office next door. The office that would soon become my own. You will join me, of course, Mr. Brandt. Of course, Mr. Koblenz. Of course I would. I always had. But beginning with today, I would enjoy it. There was not the slightest alteration in the usual ridiculous routine. Koblenz removed the little key from his chain and handed it to me. I got the brandy from the cabinet. Koblenz poured a bit of the brandy into his cup and took a sip. Hmm. Hmm, exceptionally good coffee today, but They make it yourself, hmm? What? (laughs) Why, how do you mean? Oh, don't take me so seriously, Brandt. But knowing your efficiency in all matters of the hotel, I'm sure you could prepare a very unusual cup of coffee. Well, that's very nice of you to say, Mr. Koblenz. But I know you haven't time to waste in making coffee. Too busy thinking of ways you can work your way into my job, aren't you? Hmm? And as I told you before, you won't get it while I live, and I come from a very long-lived family. Yes, surely. More coffee, sir? Nothing could possibly go wrong. I had found out enough from Dr. Tomlinson to know that humans, and I stretched a point to include Paul Koblenz, that humans responded to drugs in very much the same way as rats. That was the reason rats were used for experiments in medical research. Almost invariably, the drugs that could kill a rat could kill a man. But the powder would never be detected only its effect, when after months of tiny doses, Koblenz would suddenly learn that he was harboring the hidden killer, 6R. I 
kept the powder in my jacket pocket. As the weeks passed, it became a matter of routine to put some in Paul Koblenz's daily coffee. But try as I would to remain calm, sometimes the excitement of it would become almost unbearable, particularly at the moments when I served the coffee. Mr. Brandt, I can't tell you what pleasure this afternoon cup of coffee gives me. And, of course, it gives me one of the few chances I get during the day to see my busy and uh, trusted assistant. That is a pleasure, too. Thank you, Mr. Koblenz. Oh, I uh, received a letter a few days back from a Dr. Ernst Tomlinson. Tomlinson? He was a guest here, I believe, for several days. Oh, really? Well, I I don't... Surely you haven't forgotten. He wished specifically to be remembered to you. The gentleman with the rats. Rats? Oh, oh yes, I, I do recall something. Yes, of course. I realize, Mr. Brandt, that I have allowed many of my managerial duties to fall on your capable shoulders, uh, which action has perhaps given you a mistaken opinion of your authority on these premises. But really, Mr. Brandt, live rats in a room. The animals were caged? I think I should have been consulted. Fortunately, our other guests were not cognizant of the fact that we were for two days uh, zookeepers of a sort. If they had known, I'm afraid, Mr. Fenwick should have immediately replaced you. I'm sorry, Mr. Koblenz. Yes, I am sure. The good doctor seemed quite taken by you, Mr. Brett. Have you a personality side you've never shown me? I've always considered you rather dull. Will that be all, Mr. Koblenz? You're angry. Well, no matter. See, yes, that would be all. I'm rather tired today. Go, please. Dr. Tomlinson had written, but only to compliment me. That was good. He hadn't missed any of the yellow powder. As far as Koblenz's insulting behavior was concerned, well, there wouldn't be much more of it. Dr. Tomlinson had said there were no outward effects to 6R. The tiny admission of fatigue on Paul Koblenz's part was, I felt, a good sign. watched Paul Koblenz grow progressively more testy and insulting. Two weeks into the fourth month of Experiment 6R, and in a way I didn't expect, the last scene began. Under the insurance laws of our state, all employees participating in group insurance had a yearly physical examination. The four months Dr. Tomlinson had considered necessary to allow the growth of 6R were almost completed. By now, 6R would have taken hold of Paul Koblenz sufficiently to be recognized in a medical examination and sufficiently to be at that point incurably fatal. Even at this late date, there were outwardly no signs of Koblenz's illness, which would make the announcement by the insurance doctor even more shocking. It was a nervous moment. Brand speaking. Mr. Brand. I have set aside 2.30 as the time for my visit to the insurance doctors. That should get me back to my office for coffee. After which, if you have no pressing duties, you may... Yes, Mr. Koblenz. At 3 o'clock, I heard him come back into his office next door. He walked rather heavily, I thought. I wanted desperately to see him at once, to see the reaction he must have to the news the insurance doctors had given him. But I waited. Finally, it was 3.15. Brandt speaking. Coffee, Mr. Brandt. Yes, Mr. Koblenz. The waiter had brought the coffee tray as usual. I carried it in. Koblenz sat quietly at his desk, his face partially in the shadow from the drawn blinds. You'll join me, of course, Mr. Brandt. Oh, thank you, Mr. Koblenz. Here's the key. I set the tray down, took the little key to the liquor cabinet which stood against the wall, and bent over to open it. There was a new mirror above the cabinet, and when I saw it, it made me drop the bottle. Anything wrong, Mr. Brandt? You seem startled. The cups. The cups. You've turned absolutely white as death. But then I meant to talk to you. You haven't been looking well for some time. You... you changed... I beg your pardon. You you switched the coffee cups. 
Well, I turned away to get your brandy. I always do. It is an old custom in my family. An old German custom. A very old custom. A very old and long-lived family. Have you all this time? Yes, Mr. Brandt. All this time. Oh. Operator, connect me with the insurance doctors, please. In 308. Is it possible for you to see Mr. Brandt immediately, doctor? Thank you. It's urgent. And so, experiment 6R is finished. I am glad to have been of service to science, but I just couldn't die without sharing the the credit with Mr. Koblenz. I am sorry truly sorry that he could not be there with you today in his old capacity as manager of the hotel. But Mr. Fenwick saw fit to discharge Mr. Koblenz when it was brought to his attention that live rats had been permitted to spend the night in one of our rooms. And now, thank you for your attention and and goodbye. Just bringing your order, Mr. Brandt. Your friend just phoned and told me. If you'd only mentioned it before... We... Friend? Mm-hmm. Mr. Koblenz. Koblenz? But I, I didn't order anything. Oh, now, Mr. Brandt, it's no trouble. We know now about your little custom. If you want coffee at 3.15 every day, you shall have it. Come now. It's just 3.15. Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, John Lund, in Experiment 6R. Uh, John, do you mind if I ask you a question? Why, of course not, Harlow. Okay. What do you think of Autolite resistor spark plugs? Well, Harlow, let's put it this way. Yes? I can't imagine you selling anything but the best. Oh, well, now, I... uh, don't be coy, Wilcox. You just keep right on telling people that Autolite resistor spark plugs are the best. Any more questions? No, John, and thank you. I'll also tell people that in its 28 plants from coast to coast, Autolite makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, airplanes, and boats, including complete electrical systems for many makes of America's finest cars, batteries, spark plugs, generators, starting motors, coils, distributors, all engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be just as good. Insist on and get Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, Charles Lawton and June Havoc will be our stars. The play is called Blind Date, and it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in Suspense. Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Experiment 6R was a radio play by Donald Stubbs and Harold Kahn. John Lund may currently be seen in the Hal Wallace production for Paramount, My Friend Irma. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Van Johnson, Edward Arnold, and Betty Davis. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense. Starring Charles Lawton and June Havoc. You can buy Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite stay full batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.